Goodbye. I've got it. <clears throat> you opening? Yes. What is it? A map. The what? Directions. Where people should look to find me. Okay. Give me a moment. Mm. Have I? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. Yes. But how is it a map? If someone wants to find me, those are the groups they should look for. <laughs> and then? You are the salt of the earth. So the directors of The Chosen depicted the scene with uh, Jesus actually rehearsing the Sermon on the Mount with Matthew before delivering the sermon. But when we go to Matthew's Gospel, what we read is this. There was large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, from Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan that had followed Jesus. And when Jesus saw the large crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. So this Sermon on the Mount that we began last Sunday, uh, we are meant to hear these words, to hear the teaching, but we're also meant to imagine the backdrop, the scene in which the words were delivered. We're meant to picture the large crowd and then this small group of disciples. And so this sermon is uh, intended to highlight what does the life of discipleship entail. And right away, Jesus began with some really provocative statements about what it's, uh, who is considered blessed in the kingdom of God, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted, 
for having followed Jesus. These words reveal a reversal of what is highly valued in the world's eye and what is highly valued in God's eye. And so this morning we're going to continue the Sermon on the Mount. Join me as we pray for the reading of God's Word. Father, we recognize that these words were spoken thousands of years ago by your son to a small band of disciples, but they are also intended for us as well. So we ask that you would help us hear you by the power of your spirit and give us the grace to respond appropriately. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're reading from Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse... 13. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So before we dive into the metaphors of salt and light, we need to step back and compare the large crowd to this small band of disciples because unless we're really clear about what it is that differentiates these two groups, I think we will be tempted to hear something that Jesus is not saying. So what is it that, de- that separates, that differentiates the disciples from the crowd? In some respect, the answer is very little. There's very little that actually separates them. They're very much alike. At first glance, you're not going to notice any difference if you're just looking at them. The disciples were not called by Jesus because they were somehow more accomplished, more capable, more competent than anybody else. And they're also not called because they're more virtuous, more moral, or less sinful and less broken than anybody else. So in this manner, both groups of people are absolutely alike. They're people made in the image of God, trying to to make life work in a difficult world, doing the best they can. People with varying degrees of morality, varying degrees of virtue, also varying degrees of brokenness and sin. And if you think about it, it's no different today. What separates Christians from non-Christians, believers from unbelievers? Christians have not been chosen because Christians are the cream of the crop. We're not chosen because we're more virtuous or more moral or somehow less broken, less sinful than anybody else. What differentiates the disciples from the crowd, Christians from non-Christians? One thing, Jesus Christ. That's it, Jesus Christ. It's, it's only one thing, but it turns out that it's not a little thing. That one thing is everything. When a, a Christian looks at Jesus, what they don't see is a, a good teacher or a, a wise philosopher or even a good role model. Because to see that is to see something much less than who Jesus really is. When a Christian looks at Jesus, we see our Lord. We see our Savior. We see the Son of God. And so Christians are people who no longer put any hope in their own effort to lead a virtuous life in their own self-righteousness, in their own capacity to, to try really hard to modify their behavior to become a few degrees less sinful. Christians boast in one thing, hope in one thing, glory in one thing, rest in one thing, Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, 
and coming again. At the end of the day, we are only sinners saved by grace. And so the crowd is made up of sinners who have yet to be saved by grace. That's what differentiates us. So when they're sitting on the hill that day, this is not a pep talk that Jesus is giving to the disciples about how much better they are than those, those wicked people over there. This isn't, isn't it great to be on the, the winning team? This is an orientation of what it means to be a disciple, what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And we'll notice right away, before addressing their behavior, he addresses their identity who they are in Christ. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And what we've got to notice is that Jesus didn't say, you need to go out and try to be this, try to be salt, try really hard to, to be light. This is not like that exercise bike if you've ever got on that's connected to a light bulb. And you've got to pedal, and as you pedal, the light bulb begins to glow. And the harder you pedal, the more it glows. But as soon as you stop pedaling, the light bulb goes out. This is not that. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the the earth, the light of the world, because I am the salt of the earth, and I am the light of the world, and I am in you, and you are in me. Again, it's all about Jesus. Now, because of the wonderful invention of the refrigerator, we don't fully appreciate what Jesus is saying when he says, you are the salt of the earth. In a a pre-refrigeration world, salt is the preserver, and it's absolutely critical. Salt is what keeps food from going bad. So if a family wants the, the hope of having food for tomorrow, they're depending upon salt Salt is critical. And Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. And so what he's saying is that the earth needs salt. The earth is in a a state of decay, and it needs salt. Things are not progressively getting better. You know, uh, there's been a a long period of time where, where people really believe things are getting better. Things are progressing. During the the scientific revolution, during the the age of enlightenment, that was kind of the idea, progress. We're being enlightened. We're on, the human race is on this upward trajectory. We're progressing. We're becoming more sophisticated, more liberated, more educated. It seems like fewer and fewer people actually believe that today. Today, it's estimated that there are 50 million people living in slavery. That's more than ever before. 50 million people living in slavery, 25% of those people are children. One out of every five of those people are being sexually exploited today. Today, pornography is no longer limited to a, a dirty magazine in a CD convenience store. Every smartphone, every keyboard is a portal to a dark, dark world. I hesitate to even think about how AI and virtual reality is going to just take evil that much further down the road. The world faces as much need for salt as it ever has. You, Jesus said to this small community of disciples, you are the salt of the earth. The you is plural. In the South, they'd say y'all. Y'all are the salt of the earth. Together, we are all called to be the salt of the earth. The, The community of faith, the church, is called to be the salt of the earth. Now, the obvious, uh, uh, the obvious observation (laughs) is this. Salt that never makes it out of the salt shaker is of no use. Like, the salt has to get out of the salt shaker to do any good. So if we, the church, are the salt of the world, of the earth, then it's our job to make sure that the salt is actually getting out of the salt shaker. 
It's not enough for us to come here on a Sunday morning and huddle together for an hour, as great as this is. It's not enough. We're called to to do more. I was wondering, what would be the... uh, what would we see if we were looking at a church that had lost its saltiness? Because Jesus goes on to say, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And then he says this, it's good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled by, by men, trampled underfoot. So what would you expect to find in a church that has lost its saltiness? Here's just a, a, a few things. I would expect to find a lot of urgency regarding things that are of little consequence and very little urgency regarding things of significant consequence. In other words, a church would be majoring on the minors, minoring on the majors if it was losing its salt. I'd expect to find a church that that has this strong emphasis on form, over function, on the traditions of men over the the purpose. I'd expect a fascination with Jesus the Savior. Isn't it great? We have a Savior in Jesus and an absolute disinterest in Jesus the sender. I'd expect to find a church that is disconnected from her community. There'd be no missional identity. Mission would be reduced to the money that we send to some faraway land for somebody doing mission way over there. I'd expect to find a church that no longer has any empathy for the crowd. We think bad of the crowd. Bad people. We've got our lifeboat. Too bad for them. According to the Hartford Institute of Religious Research, 85% of churches in the United States are in a state of decline right now. You've heard me say this statistic before. 85% of the churches in the U.S. have stalled or are in a state of decline. 70% of the world's Christians, they don't live here. They don't live in Western Europe. They live in Africa. They live in Latin America. They live in Asia. Only 18% of our population in the United States right now is actively involved in a church. One out of every five people. If the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. According to Jesus, salt that is left in the salt shaker loses its saltiness. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world, which is to say the world is in a state of darkness. The world needs needs light. And the thing about it is the world doesn't recognize that it's in a state of darkness. We've all had that experience where you're outside and, and it's becoming dusk and it's gradually getting darker, but your eyes are adjusting as it gets darker. And you go inside thinking it really isn't that dark outside. You turn around in the lighted kitchen, look out the window, and it is pitch black. But you didn't recognize that because your eyes had adjusted to the dark. The world doesn't know it's in a state of darkness because the world's eyes have adjusted to the dark. Things that are are foul no longer seem foul. What is shameful is celebrated. What ought not be done is normalized. What ought to be done is easily discarded. When you live in darkness long enough, your eyes adjust. This is the state of our world. This summer, Karen and I purchased a a string of lights that uh, is strung over our patio. It goes back and forth a few times between our our shed and our, our house and They're just small little light bulbs, but it is amazing when you plug that in, the amount of light that that gives over the the patio. It's it's beautiful, bordering on obnoxious, but, but it's beautiful, and the darker it gets, the more beautiful it becomes. I, I, I see this as an image of the church, 
every little, ch every church, one light bulb on that string of collective light bulbs. And when we're plugged into Jesus and we are being the salt of the earth and we are being the light of the world and, and you plug us in, it creates an enormous light. This is a picture of the church. You're the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine. In the same way, that salt that, that remains in a salt shaker becomes, becomes dormant, becomes inactive. Light doesn't belong hidden under a bushel. Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer, he's given this tremendous gift. His bright, shiny nose, but he's embarrassed by it. He's ashamed by it, and so he tries to cover it up, snuff it out, hide it. But then one day, he recognized that the team of reindeer needed the light from his nose if they're going to fly into the dark night sky. Let's learn a lesson from Rudolph. Let the light shine, and the light is Jesus. This dark world needs Jesus' night lights. I heard a, another pastor use this illustration of two great lights that govern our world, the, the sun and the moon. Both shine, but only one produces light. The sun produces light. The moon reflects the light. We get into trouble when we do our, our good works so that people see our good works and glorify us. And it's seductive, and it's easy to do that. There's only one sun, and we're not him. We're called to be the moon. We're called to reflect the light of the sun. And so people see our good deeds, and what do they do? They glorify our Father in heaven. So come back to the hill, see the small band of disciples, see the great crowd. This is a picture of the world and the church. And if I'm understanding Jesus correctly, what he's saying is you all, the church, your reason for being is the world. I have called you, I have given you a mission, I have called you together for one purpose, and it's, it's not for this, it's for, it's for the crowd. You're called to be salt to the earth. You're called to be a, a light to the world. This is our reason for being out of the salt shaker, out from under the bushel, in the world, for the world, for Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 